all and welcome to the Enjoy College Tour. Uh, it's an initiative from me, Yannick van Haarskamp and Dirk Sparidans. Uh, we're both former Dutch national team players. Uh, we're very proud to host our guest, Vital Heine, today. He is the coach uh, of world champion Poland. A few years ago, he was uh, my coach in Noliko Mazaik for, for three years. And we just missed the Champions League Final Four. Uh, it was my best achievement uh, as a player, but uh, Vital became one of the best uh, coaches in the world after that. Uh, we're happy uh, that he's uh, that he's here, uh, and we will start with a with a small video uh, because Vital was before he was a coach, he was also a volleyball player. Het is voor alle spelers bijna de eerste Final Four op Claudio weer na. Dus iedereen zat er een beetje met, wij willen iets bewijzen, maar het moet ook lukken. Dat is een blamage voor de Olympische kampioenen. België wint zijn eerste kwalificatiewedstrijd op papier ook de moeilijkste met 3 tegen 0. Je voelt dat je de Olympisch kampioen, de Europees kampioen, dat je die aan de andere kant ziet, ziet leiden, ziet afzien. Dat gevoel wat je dan krijgt van je ziet mensen als Bas van der Goor vertwijfeld rondkijken, niet meer weten wat de oplossing is. Ik bedoel, dat gevoel kunnen creëren bij zo'n mensen, ja, dat is uniek. So yes, uh, welcome Vital also from my side. Very nice to have you here. Uh, just to start, um, can you tell us something about yourself? I mean, I, I was planning to say in a statement that no comment. I mean, if you see all the images of me, it's like, hmm. And why is no comment? I have to be very honest, why is no comment? I was maybe not so bad a volleyball player, but I find for myself that I have I think I'm a better coach, but also I have much more fun in being a coach. Uh, it's, I think a lot of coaches sometimes still talk about the time before, but I love this time to be a coach. So I find it a bit like, hmm, that was me, but oh, I would do so much. I would coach this guy so different and learn so many things different. So that's it. Yeah, I, I think I would like to be my own coach to make me play a bit better, even if I think on the level of Belgium, I was a pretty good player. And like um, Yannick said, I even played, Yannick missed the, the, the final four. I played some final four, so even a couple of times in the final of the Champions League. So it's not so bad, but still, yeah, I get old, have much more knowledge. So that's one. I think I like to be coach. Even if you talk about me, talk about myself, it's that I was not planning to be a coach. I was always planning to do some real job and it was never happening. So... I ending up being a coach and every year I tell it will be my last year and till now every year at the end I think like okay we do one more so now I have the dream of the Olympic Games and then I will think about something else but probably somebody will find for me a challenge and I will do one more challenge so I think that's a, a first answer but who am I I was I was an average to normal player Yannick was a better setter with his hands his mind, his mind, I don't want to judge, no, okay. Okay, okay, okay. So, yeah, you told us that if you were a coach, I'm just curious also what you would teach yourself as a player now, but also being inspired by the coaches you had. Which coach did you learn from the most? Mm -hmm. I mean, I had one coach, Anders Christiansen, for, I think, I think 10 years. So, of course, he's a big influence on me. A big influence, mostly on the technical level, what he learned me about volleyball. But um, I think like most setters, I was not an easy player. I was fighting with almost every coach. And when I started to coach, it was much more the idea, like I saw so many things going wrong 
And I was thinking, maybe, I know, maybe, I was convinced I can do different. So a lot of things are coming from, no, not this way. I took good things, but mostly also things from people who are not following. Like, I believe in the power of the players. I think players are very important. So I'm busy a lot with how to make players better. Yeah, I think that is one of my challenges and give the players the chance to develop them themselves. So that I was missing sometimes a bit. The coach was too important. And I try to be less important, even if it's not so easy. Yeah, so so, so you, le you, you learn from every coach, that's something. But I learned the good and the bad things. I think that's important. Not only talk the good and the bad things, and from there you make yourself. And I guess that players do the same with me. They learn from me the good things, but I also have bad things they learn from me. I hope so. So, so yeah, on one hand, don't underestimate your influence, but on the other hand, uh, the players who are next to each other in the court, they are also like really important for the end result. Like, like that's what I, what I think that you're also say like in this kind of uh, idea, who was your best teammate at that time? You were a player. Ooh, that's a difficult question. That's, uh, I think teammates is much more about friends. I had a guy with me, Pascal Wolfos, who is, uh, he played with me for years and we became friends and we are still friends and meeting each other. And I think, I, I think the nice thing about playing volleyball, I tell my, I have three daughters and I always told them like, one thing you have to do, you have to do a team sport. A team sport brings people together. You learn to play together. You learn to lose together. To win is, of course, much nicer. You learn disappointment if you're not playing. Sometimes I think a team sport is the best you can have. And you make friends for life. Yeah. And like there, I have a couple coming from my playing together. Not so much a teammate on the court, but I have friends for life in Angie Urenaud and Pascal Lofos. And like guys, you maybe don't meet too much, but who are really always... Yeah, people I can build on. If I need them, I can call them. Nice. Thanks for the answer. I mean, in the end, you didn't think about becoming a coach. You became a coach in the end. And uh, here's a small video from you being that coach. You were beating Menen, you were beating Kruijbeke, you were beating Rooselare. You deserve to be here. You deserve to win that cup. You have to play one match for that. Let it go! There's a gun line. We are giving the points away. Stop this bullshit! It's us controlling the game that we have to change, guys. Sterke blok van Mazaik beslist de gouden set. Zo bereiken de Limburgers voor de vijfde keer een Europese Final Four. Op rij Roeslaren is de titel weer voor Mazijk. De elfde titel uit de clubgeschiedenis komt er na een schitterend seizoen, want Mazijk won ook de beker en behaalde zilver in de CEV-cup. Het is gedaan! Mazijk pakt voor de twaalfde keer de Belgische beker. En het is Jelte Maan en dat is mooi en dat is verdiend. Mazijk wordt voor de twaalfde keer in zijn clubgeschiedenis landskampioen. Vital Heine, ja, coach van het jaar en na vandaag uh, is dat dus zeker verdiend. Het is Deens Klopwijk die hem haalt en Mazijk wint de laatste set met 19-25. De wedstrijd met 1-3 en behaalt brons in de CEV Cup. Mazijk wint met 3-1 van de Italiaanse landskampioen en dat is zonder meer een stunt van formaat. De Limburgers winnen met 3-0 en slepen zo de 14e beker in de clubgeschiedenis in de wacht. Oké, okay, Vital, you, uh, you told us that uh, you, wasn't plan you weren't planned to be a, be a coach, but... Pretty fast after your career, you started to be a coach. Uh, with which idea you started? Mm, like, I, I, like I said before, I was not planning to be a coach for a long time. The last month I was thinking, no, I can't do that. But I started with the idea to be coach for one or two years. Just to show that there's another way. And then after one or two years, I will go to my... I studied for a commercial engineer and I will go to a job and work every day. 
and see what we can do there. That that was the idea. Mm -hmm. I think the, the second idea was like not only having the play, but also having fun. And maybe at the end of my career, I was not having fun as a player anymore. So I thought like my guys will have fun. And I think I, I still do that. I want that my players enjoy to play volleyball, that they are coming to the training and they have to love it. I think that's something I still find the most important. I would hate it when a player is coming to tell me it's boring to work with you. That would be the worst comment. Or like I often say, if they're coming to me and they say to me, you're normal, it's another really bad comment to me. So that I think, yeah, that was in the beginning, maybe the idea. And it still is. I mean, I think I, I didn't change so much in basic ideas. Um, I was always believing that my basic ideas will, on a certain moment, not enough to win anymore. And maybe it is, but till now I was always winning. Yeah, and I'm not to bad level. So the question is like, when will this basic ideas not be enough? I don't know. We will talk after Olympics and maybe finally I failed. But till now I, I made always the goals I had in, in mind for the team or the president had in mind for the team. So that is, we will see. Yeah, so, okay, fun is a really good, strong point. Like you, the games before the training uh, is one of the things I think you, it's, it has to be fun. Is, uh, is that uh, one of the reasons you say it needs to be fun? So I start with games before the, in the beginning of yes. the practice? It was very easy. I was playing for 20 years. We had a fixed warming up every day in the morning and the afternoon from, I think, 12 or 16 minutes, the same exercises. And I get, I got crazy. Yeah. So I thought like, if I will be the coach, we will never run around the court or we will never do, what is it? Knee lifting or heel, heels against the ass or something like that. That kind of exercise we will never do. And I think I, I achieved that now for 15 years of coaching. My guys, I never do that. The only thing I need always in the beginning of the training, they need two laps running so I can put up the exercise. Yeah, so I have to prepare the exercise for that. You have to run two laps, and these are the only two laps they are running with me. And it has to be very slow running, so they give me some time. And then I like that the guys take a ball and have fun. And I still do that, and I still do it on every level. And I have that nice story when I became coach in Poland, on national team, and I was thinking, like, mm, this will be... I mean, these are the stars of the world, the better players. They will not like it. So in my first week, I was not doing my stupid games. Yeah, I started a bit more traditional. And after the second week, I did it one time. And already in the first time, Kubia came to me and said, Coach, this we have to do every day. And also in Poland, I started every day with my stupid or creative games. And I think I never give it up. I tell players always, if you don't want, if you just want to run on the court, you're allowed. But it's, I never saw a player who, who was not doing those games. Yeah, the ones who want to do traditional warming ups come sometimes come 10 minutes earlier, but then they don't want to miss the chance to, to play with a chair or I don't know, like something who is not normal. Is it and um, is there also like um, only it's not only fun, but is there also a way of thinking behind it? But now I have to, eh? like I became an, an important coach, so I have to explain things. And say yes there is also a technical aspect and they learn to play with both hands and they learn to think but i cannot forget the basic point is that you come i went in the first years between 2012 to 2015 16 i went three four times to a team who was losing all the matches so players are coming to the training after having lost i don't know how matches co coach kicked out and then the new coach is there i think the first thing you wanted the players are smiling they were losing like five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten matches in a row. The first thing you want to play a smile. So my start was we play something and they smile. And maybe it was their first smile in months. Yeah, that's the most important. And nowadays, yes, I, for example, I put a lot of effort on playing with the left, the, not your left arm, with your weak arm. A lot of games have the weak arm in focus because we don't play so much with our weak arm. We always play with it. If you're right side, you play with the right arm. So that we do a lot and I put it in it, but it's not the most important. Yeah, I love to do sometimes really something like, no, this is not done. Sitting with seven guys on a chair, it doesn't matter what it means, but something where they know it's not done just to make them smile. That's the most important. And small, a small part is technical, but it's really more for, for the ones really, coaches who are listening, yes, there's also a technical aspect, but don't believe it too much. 
<laughs> I agree. It's it's really fun. Uh, it's I always love to come to the practice uh, because I knew there were always games. So, but besides uh, besides of the of the games, what are your strong points uh, as a coach? Whoa, that's um, this 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 period of Corona is very interesting because I do a lot of talks for other coaches. And I realized I don't know it. I mean, I realized that I do a lot of things where I think they are good. But what makes me the coach who's running exactly, I don't know. Is it this creative game to the beginning? Afterwards, we always play two against two. And I think nowadays I have like 150 variations. Is it that I put so much focus on having a good contact with the players and even, I think, also now with families and everything. Is it the way I analyze teams a bit different than other coaches are doing? I don't know which element makes my team winning. Is it, like you heard on the video before, I can be very direct in my communication. I can push players. There are so many elements that I don't know which one makes me win. Yeah, and it's very hard to, like, to, to change it. Like, mm, which one? I, I'm afraid to change that. So I even don't worry, Yannick, if I was shouting on you in video the go, I still shout sometimes on my players when they are not performing. Yeah, players know that, but players know that I do it to make them better and not just to get mad, but everybody needs, we all professionals and you can say like, yeah, the guy is doing full and everything. I think sometimes an extra push is helping and players will perform a bit better. Yeah, and that they also give, I still, so I, I don't know, like there's so many small elements together at the end, I would say it's because I'm busy with everything. I'm busy with how, in which car the players play, driving in which apartment the players living, how the, the children of the player are doing, how the parents of the player are doing, how he is training, how he is feeling, how he how he's doing techniques, how he's doing tactics. I think I want to be a coach for for everything. I think that's maybe 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 my strong point. I do everything and nothing. Your your good point is that you're good in everything. No, 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 I'm not. I'm not. I don't want to be good in everything, but I think I'm involved with everything. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. think I, I go back to a story in Poland. I told a lot why we were winning the world championship. For me, one of the biggest step was I was reorganizing the rooms before the players could choose their roommate, and I found that the rooms were not nice. There were too much like small groups in the big group. So then I asked the players, can I, I'm a log because I asked permission, can I change the rooms? And the choice I made was you could choose, you could choose still the roommates, but you were not getting your first choice. You were always getting your second choice. And in this way we made new rooms and I found the team much more cohesion. And then you say, is that so important? No, it's not important. But at the end I saw it was one big step to make the team from like six, seven small units of two. We got a team of 12 players hanging together just by changing the rooms of the players. Yeah, and I think there I'm busy with all the kinds of things, sitting in the car. I remember in Nori Komazek, we driving with car to the matches. I was always busy who is sitting in which car, because I think it's important, like which communications you make, who's playing, not only the foreigners, not only the guys who don't speak Flemish, not, not only the Dutch guys together, very dangerous to put the Dutch guy together in one car. Yeah, and this kind of things, it's all small things who are helping, even, um, Corona times, I was, um, Corona times made me do new things. So I was cooking a lot and I'm a terrible cook, but I changed now from a terrible cook to a, a bad one. Last week on the Polish training camp, I went into the kitchen and I started to discuss about food because I was learning a lot about how to cook. And I not only want my players healthy food, it has to be very good from taste. And I think you can do easy, so small changes to the, the food has to taste good. So I went into the kitchen and had a big fight in the Polish kitchen about the Polish food, not about the quality, but much more about the taste. So I'm busy with a lot of things I maybe other coaches are not busy with. Yeah, okay. And uh, you, you told me uh, about your, um, yeah, sometimes you're shouting at the team and you we were also shouting at me, no problem. But I remember, uh, I remember two moments. Uh, we were losing the cup final. Uh, from uh, Rousselin with 15-13 uh, uh, and uh, another match we were losing 3-2 uh, against Jabstrebski in the Champions League. Uh, I remember um, 
the one the, after the cup final in the in Rousselare, you went crazy in the in the in the dressing room. Everything was wrong. You were shouting, and after the three two losing in Jabstrebski, you were really proud, and you you told us how good we are. Uh, and both matches we could won, could win. Uh, how do you decide after a match? Uh, what do you do? What you are doing in the in the dressing room? I was listening to a Dutch guy. Yeah? I think that you had one. There was one amazing Dutch guy called Johan Cruyff. Yeah, and I think he's um, what he was telling was a lot of smart things. And one of the things is, is after the match is before the match. And going back to that match in the cup final. I remember that in that year, I felt a lot of times that the team was too confident, finding things too easy, and we had still to play a championship, and I didn't want to lose that championship. So after losing the cup final, I think it was very important to give a message to the players. And when are you open for a message? Directly after the match is the moment to give a message. Yeah, and I think I was giving the message there that I was not happy because I want to win the championship, because I missed for a while this... In top sport, 99.5% is sometimes just not enough. If I go back to the Champions League, I think we did an amazing trip there with a very limited team, young guys. I think on budget level, we were always playing against teams from four, five, six, seven times higher. I think we did an amazing job and we came much further than we were dreaming to go. So I could be proud to lose. Yeah, but if I was feeling that the team was not performing, I use it always for the next match. I think it's not helping. It's not helping just to shout. You have to have a, a goal. What can I do with it to perform the next time better? And the next time can be a next match, can sometimes be even next season. Yeah, but you also have to look, what can I do? Like the match is lost. I cannot change it, but you have to learn. I think everybody saw Last Dance on Michael Jordan. If you were not seeing it, it that, that is much more important than to look to me here. Yeah, because he is showing all the time you learn from losing. Nobody wants to lose, not me. Nobody, but you learn from losing much more than from winning. Even if I try, I tried always. I don't know if you remember, Yannick. I remember being one time mad on the, uh, the Nathan Bunambaina when we lost the set. Sometimes you try to win with 3-1 and still get mad and make yep. a message to the team, but it's much more difficult. Yeah, the message to the team is always easier to learn when you lose. Yeah, and it, it's always dangerous, like I think now... For example, in Perugia last year, we had a winning streak of 25 or 27 matches. I know it's not so good to go to the cup final. We lost the cup final 3-2 because if the streak is too long, the players are too confident. And it's always a balance. Confident players, but not too confident. Yeah, and I think that is... It's sometimes hard to plan to lose. Sometimes you have to plan to lose, but it's not so easy. Okay. Good and um, we want to um, we want to go to the techniques. Uh, how you see as a coach? Uh, that's also a part. Uh, I I know uh, during the practice, especially in the morning practices, you're busy with the technique. Uh, we have a, a small video from myself in the national team, and you can say something about that. Can you organize to put Yannick out of the out of the college tour for a couple of minutes so I can tell the the truth? Or if he stays, I have to be polite. It's one of the two choices you, I have. You now. don't you don't have to be polite. You mm. don't have to be polite. No. Um, but before uh, before uh, uh, going to the negative things, what <laughs> what was the reason you wanted me in uh, in your team as a setter? But I think there are two things I, I find very difficult as a coach to teach. It's hands as a setter, is the arm as a spiker. Yeah, and I think you always had great hands. You have very good hands for setting. I, 
Mm, I remember you even as a guy playing in this education team in Holland. I can't find the name directly. You were 18 or 19 or 20 years. And I was directly thinking the guy is crazy. He's running around on the court and not doing any basics good, but hands are amazing. So from that way, it was a very easy choice for, for you as a player. It was an easy choice. I saw you. I need only three minutes to be like, this guy is interesting. But even on this video, you see that you have great hands, but position to the ball is not always nice, stable. I like that people do easy things. Yeah, and you do the Michael Jordan. Huh? Michael Jordan, we talked about, was famous for jumping backwards and shooting. You are jumping always sideways and setting. And just thinking from the point of physics, it, it's not so easy to jump from right to left and at the same time be precise to the goal. So in that way, I was, I'm was i not so impressed from the video <laughs> if I see it. I like setters who just jump and land on the same spot, be nice and balanced and give a stable ball. I think the, the, the quality of a setter, you can hide things and go on, but the quality of a setter is to give a set who the spiker likes. Yeah, I think that is, and if the set is always coming different, I, I'm i not so big fan. So I was not impressed, but I mean, I hope, I really hope that this video was before working with me and not after working with me. Otherwise, I was working bad. Like I said, I did not everything good. Some Dutch guys I could influence, some Dutch guys were maybe harder to influence. Yeah, okay. So uh, that was the one thing you, you want to change with me, that I, I was jumping from right to left uh, because then the ball uh, to, the, to the spiker is not, uh, is not correct. Is there something else you, you had in mind before I, I came to practice? These things I want to change or I want to work with? I, I be honest, it's very hard to remember. Huh? I, I think it's... I mean, about setting, not so much. I think maybe the ball behind you worked a bit on um, my feeling, but I remember, but now I'm, I'm laughing to myself so long ago. How long is it ago, Yannick, I was coaching you? Six, yeah, six? Yeah, maybe when, it's, it's around 10, maybe already. 10, ten, years, ten ago. years I would consider you as a bad defender, in my feeling. I think you should have, I think training defense is my feeling you should have done with you. Eh? But I'm not remembering so sure anymore, but that is my coming to my mind. That we were working on defense, I think. Yeah? yeah, so I think you were a setter, like a setter, you were good. I think you had yeah, you had you had very good hands. I guess we were talking much more about tactics, how to play than techniques, so because your hands I was never seeing as a problem. Yeah, and I think that that is like I said, I don't believe changing the hands. We work a bit on balance, but I love that setters can think and can explain why they set the ball that you don't see here, but I love that setters have every action has a meaning. Yeah, that we were talking at the beginning of what you think as a coach, I want simple things. And simple is that you can explain me why you set the ball there. That's all. I don't have to agree, but it has to be a meaning. I don't want that you just play. And that's something, yeah, something I still do. I still want that my setter can explain me every set, why he's doing what. And if you can do that, then we can discuss about it. And there's not always one solution. I also will not be bad on, on, on if a setter makes a good choice and the spike is not scoring, I will never be mad. But if a setter makes a choice, like why we are doing this in this moment, it's for me much more difficult. So that is that I remember, but I have to be very honest, this in 10 years, I exactly remember what we are training. I think you will remember more. I know from experience that players remember more why I was not sometimes not so happy. Um, yeah, I, I remember for sure. I, I remember the uh, I remember the steps that I couldn't make one step forward, not one step side sidewards. But uh, after that, uh, for a lot of times, uh, I always I also know that we were trying to do uh, uh, setting behind the same as setting forward. Yes, that that's true. That's that's something I still do. I want that. Uh, on the moment of the contact, this, the block cannot see where you are setting. Yeah? yeah, and I think, for example, this year with uh, Luciano De Cecco had a very good case in this. Yeah? Luciano De Cecco is really, it's one of, why he is so good? Because on the moment of the contact, you have no idea what he's going to set. Yeah. Also, he had some problems, and that's typical on those setters with good hands. Maybe you were not as good as Luciano De Cecco, but you were not really not a bad set at all. These good setters are sometimes lazy in coming to the ball, yeah, and then unprecise, but I think you have a bit the same type in 
the hands to the ball and then not be able to read what's happening. I think that's the quality of the Checo. It's so hard. You, you see the ball in the hand and you still don't know he's going to play. It makes the block so difficult. So it's something we work on, but it's not easy for players. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's uh, it's nice. So two things you are working with every setter, so not jumping left and right and front, and also uh, to play uh, front row and like uh, behind it. It's the same same movement. Okay, and um, we have also a movie about uh, Derek being a, a receiver and defender, and we are curious. Uh, I was never I was never coach. coaching Derek. I was never coaching him. No, but so your I, perspective. I, <laughs> what, what I, was you... never, I was never taking him, so it says already something. <laughs> you don't put his bad fingers here on the screen. Yeah, you it's can... just the, it's the reality. The reality we cannot huh? we cannot deny. Huh? You can tell him what, what you would do if he's tomorrow in practice with you. Okay. So I must admit I'm a little bit uh, scared now. So one thing, seeing this video, uh, what do you think was good about me as a player? Yeah, but, I mean, I'm always curious. What do you think about yourself? W w were you a better passer or defender? I would think I was a better defender. So I worked really hard on my tactical reading skills because I wasn't technically I was not so good i was not like the others i think tech, uh, technically so i did work a lot on my tactical like how to watch the ball uh, how to get information on where the people are going to serve to take more risk in tactical wise so i think i could be a better technical player but i was i think quite good and and you had you had a preferred side to play the ball left or right I mean, I still remember uh, <laughs> Vital one conversation with us. I uh, still remember the place. So that's why you said also, like the players sometimes remember more about what I say than, than what I remember. And that's normal, of course, because you've seen so many players. But I had really a preference to receive on my left side. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's really the first thing you told me when we had a conversation uh, uh, together. So yeah, for sure, I had a, I had a preference, yeah. Yeah, but you see that on the images, like what I see, it, it's of course it's very hard to judge a libero on ten actions. Eh? Yeah, it, it's like easy, like you can. Smart people nowadays make these highlights and take the best actions, and it's very hard to judge. But you see directly this tendency to be afraid to pass on your right side. Yeah, even on the left side, you have a good. I like a distance between your arms and your legs when you pass. There has to be the angle, there has to be a diff distance so you can really push the ball. And you will see if you re look the images, on your left side, you try to make distance. On your right side, you let the ball come so close to your body. So it will be very difficult to pass on your right side. And so there's a big technical difference between left and right. Uh, a second thing is I don't like, I like easy things. So if you are able to pass a ball and stay on the floor, not doing anything, it means very good. I, you have to check your passings. Very few times you just pass and do nothing. Yeah, the, the after action is often a very good indication of a passer. Eh? I mean, the, the worst I find is if passes are falling backwards after passing and almost rolling. I think you had one action like this. That I would never accept from my players because it means that position to the ball is that you fall back, now we go back to the basketball, you are falling back and you have to bring the ball to the net. It's a very difficult combination. Yeah, I, I think if I was you, I would have worked more on a bit moving before the ball. Yeah, I think you have a good left side. The left side was okay. I agree that you tried to play on the left side, but you should have to work on the right side to have the same distance. 
and you should have avoid to be have always the knee on the floor i think with a good moving and nice balance we go back to the setting is the same if you have a good balance you should be able to play and afterwards stay in balance yeah so that i would have technically worked with you mm. i think i think it's possible for sure on float surf to work on that we have to be very honest the volleyball is changing to more powerful physical aspect becomes more and more difficult like in our times i speak in 10 years ago you had a good jump serve the jump serve was doing 110 kilometers an hour nowadays if you're not 105 107 is nothing it's not considered a jump serve in perugia i have two guys over 130. i think the good jump serve has to be over 120. i remember i remember well that hido gertsen the national team player was the first guy going 100 and we speak in 20 years ago or oh, no it's more it's 30 years ago so the time before you can pass the ball is smaller and smaller so what i ask on players is more and more difficult it's not so easy to not move afterwards it's becoming more difficult still we are working on it yeah so i'm just curious how do you train that like the the moments before touching the ball i mean it's a lot about technical skills about the moment you touch the ball and that's what you also mentioned the room between the legs and the arms on one side is better than on the other side so how would you train a person for the movements before and after touching the ball yeah, but I, I think it, if if the movement before is good after the after the touch is nothing happening anymore huh? Yeah, and I think you have like on a float survey about I always think you have two contacts you can have two steps and on a drum surf you can have one contact that means you can step left and right yeah and there you work on yeah and i think it's um it, it's much more i think i'm sure players have to be aware of what they are doing i think uh, after like my influence is limited i will tell a couple of times what to do and then you have to find self your way but you will feel much more easier to play if you are able to make one step stop be in balance and then play with the arms you will feel much more comfortable in playing than if you are jumping around and have to play yeah and i think it's um yeah it's, it's a focus it's a focus it's not so difficult one i i believe that passing you can learn a lot yeah the platform and that you had a good one that's harder to teach it's like the the setting the hands on yannick the platform was good so the the basic start for good passing was there but i think the technical things sometimes i was not from my point of view not liking other coaches maybe like it yeah, that's everybody's choice. Like, I, I'm, not, I'm not the guy to judge. It's like I make my own techniques and things about it. But I saw in general the players pass a bit better after getting used to this kind of uh, ideas. Well, yeah, so it's a lot also receiving really can, can lose the game for you. I mean, that's something, especially in men's volleyball, like when serves are like what you said, uh, 110, 120, or also good float serve over 70 uh, kilometers an hour. So the point of how to see the ball coming to you, do you play, uh, pay specific attention to it in your trainings? Like what you say, uh, exactly be there on the moment that the ball is there, the reading skills from the players, do you train that or do you do tactical stuff with it? Do you watch video or, or how do you do that? I don't, I don't train it. <laughs> it's easy. Huh? I think the mistake for me is, first you have to be technical good and then we can start working on the eyes i think the eyes are interesting but i think first you have to work on how to move yeah i think that's same for the setter same for the middle blocker same for the receiver learn to move yeah and if you know how to move then we go to the next step yes we will work but i think let us be honest how many balls you're passing Five hundred thousand. i think you were training enough on your eyes yeah? Maybe you can train. I think nowadays with this Tobos, or how's the name of the of the the glasses you can use? I think it's helping a bit. Yeah, I tried it also, but there I'm not enough expert. So I go to the easy things. I know how moving from the feet can be. Yeah, and I know that is a very fast way. Fast way means in one year you can learn to be a better passer with it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I, still use it. I still use it. Yeah, so let's go jump back a little bit on the professional athletes, which we were and which you are working with, like you said, play 500,000 balls. So your eyes, they train every ball. But if you would become like, if you would teach children how to receive, or you teach people who are only playing two or three times a week volleyball, and how do you, how do you teach them to receive, tactical and technically? Yeah, but I'm only busy with techniques. Eh? This old tactic I don't like. I like techniques. Uh, so I go often, I have a daughter now, she's 15, but I, I, I go often to go, oh, not often, sometimes I go and give trainings 
to them and I go to techniques and techniques and mostly is players have to understand. Eh? I think um, I was not starting, but I, I don't know. The most books are like known. I think if you read the book Talent Code, they explain that you have to do one action and always get a feedback. And uh, the information in this book is confirmed by a book from like you no know, one and a half year ago is the book Peak from Ericsson, who's confirming this. Like the way to learn is to do one action, get a feedback, and do the next action, and learn how to move. And after a while, I think the the, the idea was always. After 1,800 repetitions perfectly in a row, you have you are mastering a move. So it takes a while. Yeah, then you learn how to move. Yeah. And I'm not so like I said, I'm not a big, I don't say fan. I'm not an I don't know enough about training eyes. Yeah, and maybe it's interesting, but till now, like I said, with my easy principles, I was not doing so bad as a coach. And I read about it, but till now I'm not convinced enough to say like yes, this eyes training is the crucial part. Yeah, I see, I was working, for example, with a not so bad player, Wilfredo Leon, for one year, and I, he really improved in passing. It's really clear that his figures were so much better in one year time. But this easy things, be behind the ball, be in a good position, make one step, stay in balance, yeah, and make him aware of those things, he improved a lot. Maybe the next time is to go to ice, I don't know yet. Okay. Well, thanks. We have uh, also like a, a tactical uh, thing, um, which Yannick is going to speak a little bit with you about it. But so I, I was not finished to kill you. <laughs> we, we were we were talking about receiving, but then your defense. Yeah, I, I think. What were you? Where was you? Where were you def defending the best in the line or in the diagonal? I think in diagonal. Mm, I think line. Yeah. Yeah, I think you. The the best actions from the movie you showed were the line defenses. Yeah, because there you are very good in position and you really attack the ball in front of you. In diagonal, you have the tendency to run into the court. Yeah, so I really like if I would say, if I would take you as a player, I would take you to, to defend line. Yeah, I think there was like, yes, that's interesting. Going there, position on time, and then going in, he's not bad at all there. That I found, I found a strong point looking to the 10 images. So I have to tell some, Yannick, I have to tell something good to the guy. Yeah. Otherwise, he, he will never, he will go out in Holland and tell what a bad guy I am. Eh? So I okay, did it by this. Well, first of all, Vital, I'm just also a little bit impressed that you still remember it. So, I mean, uh, I didn't, I, I, in, at least I impressed you a little bit. So that's, uh, that's what I take with me. Um, the defending part video, uh, we're going to skip, uh, not because I'm scared of your feedback, but just because of the time also. So, um, no, we're going to switch a little bit to the tactical things um, about what you think uh, is important. And I'm just going to show the small video about uh, you becoming world champion with Poland. Oh, what a block by Brazil. Good sir. Surely it's going to go to Kurek. It is. It's down. And they have done it. Poland have taken gold here in Italy. Back to back world champions. Bartosz Kurek has led this team. And he can enjoy the moment. Before uh, talking to uh, about uh, tactics, how how are you feeling uh, to see this this image again, Vital? Um, it's always goosebumps again and again and again uh, because it's. Um, I start from something else, and maybe you made a bucket list one time for me. Yeah, I love the concept of a bucket list, and I also made myself a bucket list about what my life i made my list and i would say i was finding it one time 2007 or so i made my list and as a coach i wanted to have to win something big that was all i was writing down so my highest goal as a coach i achieved in 2018 in torino by winning the world championship and it's it's a really strange feeling to stand there and to think like, wow, my team is the best of the world. It's not even the best of Europe or the best of Belgium. It's the best of the world. And there's no other team better on that day. 
I realized that for sure that week we had a fantastic week. And it's so a strange feeling that, um, yeah, you can go to this bucket list and you can put it out and say like, yeah, as a coach, I achieved much more than I was ever dreaming. Huh? Yeah, so in that way, it's always, I think, this this ball to Kurek. And I think there are images from after the match in the dressing room, this 10, 15 minutes, these are so nice things. Like. If you talk about really happiness, I think there it's real happiness with players and coach together. So it's um, yeah, it's it's absolutely a highlight of my together with the the the, the birth of my three children. These are the highlights of my life. Yeah, I can I can imagine, I can imagine it's something incredible. And uh, how how important uh, is tactics for you as uh, in general as uh, as a coach? I think we make a mistake that we overvalue tactics. Uh, like in, in this tournament, we go back how to become world champion. I think it was the mind. I think four days before the end of the tournament, I took my team separate and I just talked very short. Like, guys, we have a problem. The problem is we are the best team of the world championship. Yeah, it was not planned. We were going to the world championship to be in the first six and the first six was the maximum goal and nobody was believing Poland can win. But then the way we played, I saw the guys, we can win. And I think the the belief of being able to win is the most important. My players really believe they are going to win. Yeah, I think before the final match against Brazil, there was not one player doubting that he was going to lose. It was like, yes, we are the best team. We are going to win the final. And I think this is something we talked at the beginning of strong points. I am good in... Brainwashing is maybe the wrong word, but making people believe in things. And then tactics are a part of it. Yeah, but it's not it's not the main. I don't believe only in tactics. You have to really want to do it. So I, I, I go by years. I go more away from the importance of tactics and much more to the strength of your own team, believing in what you can do. Yeah. Nevertheless, I mean, <laughs> what can you do in a world championship? You look hundred no look, you look five, six, seven, eight matches, and you try to find something. Yeah? As a coach, tactics gives one point. But you know, we were winning the last set 25, 23. Maybe this was the one point I had to give to the team. But it's more like I love much more that I see the eyes of my players who believe in things. Yeah, okay. So um, it's you are uh, more. It's believing how to win the matches. But I remember as a player, um, you can prepare the match really good, like for tactical uh, in tactical way, uh, that you know exactly as a player what you what you have to do, especially in defense, that kind of things. Uh, how did how did you prepare your team uh, for the for the final against Brazil? But I think um, tactics have a value. Huh? Tactics yeah. have a value from how to play, but also tactics help you to stay focused on the game. I believe strongly that tactics keep the team together. We are five points behind. How do we play? Follow the tactic. We are five points in front. How do we play? Follow the tactic. I think you make a team playing in one line. I think there I believe strongly that you always have to play the same. It doesn't matter 0-0 zero, zero, or 23-23. Twenty-three, twenty-three, we play the same. And so that, that's one of the things I believe strongly. Yeah, how do I play? We always have the same preparation and a lot of same principles. I mean, no, I, I, we have the Yannick van Haskam game, but that's a two against two game. But I'm still, uh, I'm still using concepts like a Novak principle. It means the way we block on one player and the world champs, you can use this. You have a very easy concepts to explain to the team. Yeah, the team take that and then go to the match to Brazil. I don't want that they have to think too much. They have to enjoy it. Okay, so um, that's like maybe uh, something also which we are curious at. Like, so do you prepare your team differently for the Olympic final in in Tokyo next year? Like, how do you prepare your team for that? One time in 2014, we played the World Championship with Germany. And our first match was against Brazil. And never in my life I was working so hard to prepare a match. I think I remember I saw like 23 matches of Brazil. For one month I was looking through every ball. I had a feeling 
I really was thinking after the match to go to Bernardino and tell him, Bernardino, I know your team better than you, you know your own team. I was so sure. I knew everything. We started that match against Brazil. We play exactly like we had planned. We are leading 9-5 in the first set. Morillo is going to serve with a jump, easy jump float. My team starts to doubt and we lose 3-0 in one hour. All my plans, all my plans, my work had no effect because the players were not believing the plan anymore. They lost under the high pressure, the belief in the plan, yeah, and gave up and let the match go 3-0 in one hour. Yeah, and afterwards we made came back fantastic and won a bronze medal with Germany in the world championship. It was fantastic, but it shows again, yes, tactics are important, but not the most important. So what I'm busy now with my team for Olympic finals, if we ever come there, is preparing the mind. We have to be ready in our mind to win the Olympic final. And that's something it's much more important than who it is and which tactics we follow. It's so important that we get our mind yeah to be ready and in Poland where volleyball sport one I think it's maybe yeah it's one of the most important things for me the mind has to be ready to win and that's a process we are working now I think for for like six seven months after qualification and we have one more year and in the next two weeks we have a training camp and I will do the same and I will try to get the mind ready for the Olympic Games yeah, so that's like in volleyball, you have to learn to lose and you have to learn ex especially to win. And and so that's also a big part of how to train the mind. I mean, I think so, but you all already work with people like players who are the best in the world. Um, with Leon, maybe the best player in the, of his generation. So how do you specifically like build their minds towards uh, a, a game which they also never played before? Well, I think that, that I don't know. Eh? Also, I was never in the Olympic final, so we will see how it goes. Mm, but I, I, I don't, I think the better the player, the more they are convinced from themselves. Eh? So I don't see any problem that Wilfred Leon will be ready to play. Um, I think it's good that the whole team believes in it, eh? because you win with the 12 players, not with only the first three. I strongly, I'm strongly a coach who believes in the quality of the 12 players in the team. Yeah, I go back to the World Championship. We won because in the semi-final against USA, we could change Schalpu, who had problems in passing, by Schliffka, who came in and passed great. And he played only one set on the whole World Championship, or two sets. But this was maybe the most two most important sets of the tournament. Yeah, so I believe that we have to get the 12 players ready to win the medal. Yeah, and for that, I have a lot of discussion in Poland about this. You need some experience. I don't believe that players from 20 years can win a big tournament for you. I believe that the guys from 30 years, and that's why in Poland we have a big group of guys between 25 to 32, three years, all guys with experience. I believe experience, learning to win, like you said also, is a process, is a step-by-step -step process. And for sure, going to the big tournaments, yeah, you have to make them aware of that. And Wilfredo Leon bring, was playing so much, he's learning this also. Yeah, he's becoming, he's not a player from, he's 25, 26, but he was already on top level at 17 years old. So that's the only thing I can do. Make their mind by playing ready. Take those players. I believe in experienced players. Yeah, and then we will see. I'm very curious myself. It's, that's the big problem of delaying the Olympic Games one year. I'm very curious myself how we will do in one year. And I would have loved to play this summer. We were ready. All right, so... Going a little bit back in this in this in this webinar, you talked about you as a player fighting with coaches. Um, what kind of players do you like in your team? Players fighting with coaches. Yeah, you know, okay. I think uh, yes, of course. I like I like strong characters. I like players who are standing up, players who fight, players who come to me. I really like that. I mean. It's much more difficult for me to work with introvert guys who are never talking. I have to put much more effort to understand them. Yeah, and I think if um, if I go back to my last 10 years in evolution, I think there I became better. I became better understanding players who are totally different from me and working with them and finding a way. Well, it's still difficult. I think it's still difficult. It's not that I can say, whoa, I'm good in this now. It's still a difficult point. So. The easiest are the guys with the big mouth coming, shouting, 
thinking they are right because I also hold my life from a kid from six year old I was thinking I'm right and now I'm an, a grandfather of 51 I'm not grandfather yet but I could have been in age um, think still thinking that I'm right in what I'm doing yeah and I learned that it's maybe not always true but it's still once I'm busy I believe yes I know how to do it so I like those players so is that your team's strength also Vital that there are a lot of guys which are a little bit older, a little bit more experienced, which are already maybe one of the better place, uh, players in the world when they were really young, in combination with the fact that they speak up and let, let themselves be heard. Is that, is that your team's, can you, can you say that's your team's strength in Poland? Yeah, but I mean, going back to how I worked in the first year, I always worked with young guys and we were also successful. I think because I also dare, I give young guys a chance to step up and to take their possibilities to play. So I, I always do the same. I want that player step forward. Eh? Only thing is that if you work with young guys, you pay the price. Like Yannick was telling before, you lose important matches. It's a process. You have to lose important matches to win big ones afterwards. Yeah, and that's the problem from young guys. And now that the advantage I have, Poland was losing enough in the last years. Yeah, to know what they know how to lose. So now they can learn how to win. Yeah, but I think the quality is, I give just Paul, and I always told we have two guys, Kurek and Kubiak, who are leading the team by example. Not by talking. Kubiak is not a talker. Yeah, I talk often with him, but our conversations longer than six minutes are not existing. That's already like very long. Kurek can talk a bit more, but it's not a talking team. They are two leaders who are always stepping in forward, in working, in showing. I think that's the most important. The leaders of the team have to show the, I think there's a book and I'm, I don't know if you know Simon Sinek, but it's one of the most famous economical gurus talking in USA. And he has the book Leaders Eat Last. I think it's very important that the leader is showing the way and not just taking the best food and doing nothing, but waiting and pushing the team. And that, that's the strength of Poland. I mean, Michal Kubiak is, is absolutely a dream as a captain in the way I see a captain leading the team. So you just mentioned the book as an inspiration for you, where you can also work with. Um, I mean, what inspires you? How do you take more information to develop yourself as being a trainer coach? Um, does some things inspire you? But I think everything inspires me. Uh, once a coach, you try to find inspiration in everything. Yeah, yeah and that, that going, for example, on this moment, I'm, I have an audio book from 25 hours about the life of Einstein. I'm listening to it and don't think that I'm smart, but because the, the theory from Einstein is too difficult for me, the relativity theory, I cannot understand. But I try to understand how the guy was living. I read by average one, two, two to three books a week. I read in all kind of areas is about sport is about economics is about other aspects of life psychology sociology I try to read I try to I don't know how many webinars I was seeing in the last months yeah I try to listen everywhere what can I learn I have my oldest daughter is finishing as a doctor her studies now so I'm talking all the time with her about what she's learning yeah, I try to find inspiration with everybody. And even if you ask me a question, sometimes I will go back and think like, hmm, this was an interesting question. What can I take from this guys? I think you can learn from everybody. Yeah, and that is my, I, I have this problem that I have this too much energy, this um, hyperactivity I have. Yeah, so I have to do always something. Yeah, and so I'm always day and night, I'm looking to find inspiration for my games, for my volleyball, what can I do? Yeah, and I, on this moment, I, for example, I'm reading the book. I try always to read three, four books at the same time. Huh? One book is boring. So I'm reading the book from Van Gaal, the whole preparation of the World Championship from 2000, what was it, 16, 17, 18, when Holland was going to the third place. I'm reading the whole book day by day, how he was acting and doing. I, it's, it's great to read. I have had some ideas I found, like, hmm, not bad what he was doing there. And some ideas are totally different. Van Gaal is a guy who has a lot of rules and players have to follow this. And I'm a guy from no rules and not following too much, but it doesn't matter that the guy is doing different. Eh? You can find everywhere some inspiration. So that's, it's my, it's my biggest, not so much volleyball. I know the guy who's in, but now I lie. 
because one of the in this one of the webinars I was talking, somebody asked me how many matches I was seeing, seeing on on video, and then I, after the evening, like you see, it was a good question. I went home and counting, and I was realizing that I was seeing more than thousand matches in one year. Yeah, so I think I see some volleyball also. Yeah, so in that way, like yes, it's being curious is the most important quality as a coach, I think. Yeah, so all the inspirations you get by reading books, by watching webinars, by thinking every time that you want to learn something will also shape probably the future of our of our game of volleyball because you have a big hand in it, I think. So how do you see, like we were talking a little bit before already, it's going to be more about power, but how do you think that uh, our, our game of volleyball will develop in the next years, also after the Olympic Games? When I, when I start as a player, I was 191 tall, and they say, wow, what a tall setter. Huh? Yeah, and they were telling on that moment that the best height for a player player is 196. And they said it will never be tall. Now, 196 is a small guy. And now they say, yeah, you have to be like 202, 203, that's nice. But all the tall is not working. But nowadays, 202, 203 is also becoming normal. So I think we are still not at the end of the physical evolution from volleyball. I expect a team, I think Holland was famous in the 90s with a team, all guys over two meter. I'm waiting for the team with all the guys over 210 and playing because nowadays they start to move like normal persons. And this 210 guys, they have long arms and with these long arms, the impact on the ball will be higher. So I still see the evolution to be more, the power to the ball will only be higher. Yeah, I, I, so I, I, this is still not stopping. And I think everybody's saying it will stop, but it's not stopping. So I think we have to be prepared for the, the, the game will be more physical. Yeah, and I think for the guys from 190, it will be only harder and harder to survive. Yeah, and they try, but on the long term, I think on the long term, you have to be like over two meter, long arms and hitting really hard. That's the evolution where you go. So I think the, the team I want to build one time is like only guys from 2 meter 10 and see how they can survive. And that should be the dream team. Three guys, 2 meter 10 and block. No, looks okay. And so I think there we are going. That's one. Um, the second evolution is, of course, is the, it's, it's, I think, the taller the guys, the higher they jump, yeah, the more we can start to work with variation attack. I like variation attack, but there you are depending on rules. For a while, I was training a lot on pushes and pushing block out, but I think that that will change. The rules will change one day, but the rules from getting high guys who jump higher and hit harder, that will not change. So that will be the biggest evolution of volleyball. We will laugh with having guys on two meters on the court. I think in when I go, I don't know, what, when I will be really, really old, you will see only the really tall guys coming out. I, I look to Poland. There's so much physical potential coming. Yeah, I think that is still an evolution where we're going. Yeah, so depending regardless of or the, or the rules are going to change, uh, every country in Asia, like we all played China, we all played Korea, we all played Japan, which are this pushing out and uh, combinations and fast play, um, you think uh, they have no chance of surviving. But we, we look just to international evolution. I mean, 20 years ago, China and Japan, Japan were playing. Now, I don't know which results they make on international tournaments, but I, I never see them passing against European teams. The day we can send more European teams to big tournaments, the, the Asian teams will lose. I, I'm not afraid if tomorrow Holland will play against every Asian team, I think Holland is favored in my eyes. Japan is doing an amazing effort to be good for the Olympic Games, but tomorrow, Holland complete or Japan complete, I think Holland is still the better team. And I don't know, I'm, I'm now lying. I don't know, Holland is number eight, nine in in, um, in Europe at this moment. I have no exact idea. Yeah, but it's something like this. So if, in my eyes, there are at least 10 to 15 European teams who are better than the Asian teams. Uh, the same for the North American teams. I think the, the tall guys are winning. Yeah, and I think we have to wait for the development in, in, in Africa is still not there. I think you could make also better teams in Africa. On the moment that that's coming, the tall guys will win. You look to Asia, but then you look to Iran. Uh, those teams are winning. I think the teams with small people, mm -hmm. yes, it's uh, it's pity, but it's very hard, I think. Yeah, so preparing for the Olympic Games to make one step back again, you can prepare, uh, you, you can decide which teams you're going to play in preparation. 
Like, um, do you think about that or do you don't pay so much attention to which teams you play? I, I don't pay so much attention. It's like, um, I want my team good. And, and like I said, I have a team with experienced players, so much more the focus how good can play do can my players play and play together. Yeah. And of course I think that we, we need some some good matches for the Olympic Games. But what we are doing now, we are having training camps together, sitting around the campfire, playing very interesting games, but nothing to do with volleyball. I think it's much, much more important for my team than um than going to play against don't know who because we play enough matches. I guess that I was with the national team last summer. We had 46 matches, so they have enough experience of playing against top teams. If you're not not a top team and not playing volleyball nations league, I understand that those countries are looking for other matches. The ones playing the volleyball nations league play enough matches. I think we much more look for improvement of ourselves. We are busy only in one year. How much can my team be better? How much can every individual player be better? And we don't want to look too much to other countries. Okay, thanks. Well, in our program, Vital, we always end with one question. Um, if you would have get, if you have one advice you would give to players, to coaches who are watching, um, what would it be? Well, it's much more an advice. I have always one advice in life for everybody. It doesn't matter coaches or players, and that's very easy. Eh? You have to love what you're doing. I think there was a very interesting book I was reading in the Corona times who in five questions, you know what you have to do. But one of the questions is very easy. What do you love? Yeah, and it's not liking, it's really loving. Yeah, don't lose your time in life with things you don't love. Yeah, and I think that's the most interesting thing that you do that because life is so short. I mean, you are still young guys. Yeah, life goes so fast. You will only regret the things you were not doing and you liked it or you loved it. So that's what I push everybody. If you love volleyball, do it maximum. If you don't like it anymore, stop and do something else. If you love this, what you're doing, do it. Do it maximum, try. Don't look how much money you earn or don't earn on it, how much time it's costing. Somewhere, if you do things very good with full passion, you will be also rewarded for that. And if you're not rewarded, it's not even important. I mean, food you will find in Holland. Some cheese you will eat. I will eat some Belgian fries, we'll find. For that, you don't need so much money but it's much more important that you enjoy what you're doing. Vital, I want to thank you a lot for being uh, our guest today. Um, maybe the viewers, they couldn't see the images behind the, the scenes, but I was smiling a lot listening to you. And um, I'm sure Yannick also is inspired. Even though we're not players anymore, it's also always nice to speak about the, the game of volleyball. And the way you think about it with your experience lights still a fire in me. So I'm. I'm really happy uh, that you were our guest. Thanks for your, for our time. Uh, this is the end of our Enjoy uh, College Tour webinar. Uh, we will for sure uh, come back uh, soon with another inspiring guest. Uh, thank you for watching. And um, Vital, I will watch you for sure uh, during the uh, Olympic Games final in Tokyo next year. Thank you very much for being our guest. And see you soon. Bye-bye.